It is great to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your participation with us in ministry. As Jose said, we are one of your missionaries. You support us. The ministry that God allows us to have throughout Latin America is a direct result of, of our partnership together. And we thank you very much. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayers. We covet them deeply. For those of you who came to hear Brian this morning, I am sorry to disappoint you. I am the closest thing to him. <laughs> I didn't say I was the next best thing, because God's blessed you with a great team of pastors and preachers. You get to hear God's word faithfully expounded in a wonderful way every week. By the way, on Friday of this week, Baylor University released their top 12 English-speaking preachers in the United States. Did you see the list? And I wrote Brian immediately and said, Brian, I'm disappointed. I didn't see your name on the top 12. And Brian responded very quickly and said, I was number 13. <laughs> But you are blessed with a godly team of individuals lead, to lead this congregation. And, and I rejoice with you. I, I was telling my wife, Lisa is at home taking care of Amber this week while she's at, um, Brian and Vicky's taking care of Amber while Brian and Vicky are in Guatemala. Um, and I was telling her before I came, this honestly is one of the easiest places in the world for me to preach. You are the most responsive, the most excited about the Word of God, the most enthusiastic, warm, welcoming group I think that I ever speak in front of. And so thank you very much. I hope I don't disappoint you today. I really don't. Yeah. Thank you. I was struggling with my voice in the Spanish, so I'm hoping that I won't need these today, but if I do, I have them. Okay. Let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The book of Ecclesiastes, Old Testament, about in the middle, after the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the third chapter right after chapter 2, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. The book of Ecclesiastes documents... 12 chapters that document the conclusions of King Solomon in his quest to understand life. Admittedly, the book can be hard to understand. It's Hebrew poetry. It's Hebrew wisdom literature. It can be hard to understand, and, and some have even have considered it a very negative book. But, but the truth is, as it talks about life, our life can be pretty frustrating. Would you agree? Sickness and death interrupt our plans. Life often presents a series of, of, of events, a series of, of conflicting events that leave us perplexed and, and uncertain about the future of life. In fact, one of the favorite refrains of Solomon throughout the book, and you know it, is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In other words, Solomon is saying that life can be frustrating, life can be confusing, life can be hard to figure out. So I worked hard all week to try to understand the book of Ecclesiastes, and especially chapter 3, and I came across a good tool, a great book that, in my mind, clearly explains the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'd like to present it to you for just a few moments. It's a little complicated, so I'm going to have us read some of the pages together. Is that okay? The book is called Good News and Bad News. Here's the book. It's written by Jeff Mack. Let's read a page or two together. The book begins by saying, good news. But then, just as in life, the story quickly turns to bad news. But then, gratefully, life, the story turns back again to good news. 
I won't insult your intelligence. I do want to go through a couple of pages because it does, through the illustrations, picture often what happens to us in life. Good news, bad news. Good news, bad news. Good news, (laughs) bad news. Good news, bad news. Does that seem like your life? I mean, certainly God in his mercy allows us to experience moments of joy and pleasure and relationships, but we must be honest, life on this side of glory is often filled with bad news. We face discouragement. We face sickness. We face death. We face separation from our loved ones, and and we're left to make sense of all of this. Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is a beautiful, poetic text in which Solomon reminds us, and again, it's a part of the entire theme here of Ecclesiastes, but Solomon here reminds us that God is in control of all of life's events. Please listen to me. This is a vitally important message as we face the daily occurrences of life. Solomon reminds us here that our great, powerful God is in control of all of life's events. He is the sovereign Lord. Our God is the sovereign Lord who guides and governs his creation toward his good ends. And here's the message in a nutshell as I share this passage of Scripture with you this morning. Solomon here encourages us that through the uncertainties of life, we are encouraged to rest. We are encouraged to trust. We are encouraged to derive comfort from this truth that our all-wise, all-good, all-powerful God is in control. Do you believe that? Solomon develops this thought through three ways. Let me share them with you this morning. I want to walk through this passage of Scripture. First of all, in verses 1 and 17, Solomon makes a statement regarding God's plan. Look with me, Ecclesiastes 3.1. Look at this statement. He says, for everything there is a season. And did you note the singularity of that? He doesn't say for everything there is a variety of seasons. He says for everything there is a specific season and there is a specific time for every matter under heaven. This is a declaration that Solomon, under the inspiration of God, is making, and he is saying that God is in control of every circumstance in life. Jump with me down to verse 17. This is what we call in in Bible interpretation an inclusio. It's like bookends. So Solomon puts the same thought at the beginning of the section, and then he puts the same thought at the end of a section to tell us that everything in between is talking about this theme. Verse 17, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, and notice here the repetition, for there is a time for every matter under the sun. These words, a season and a time, are precise designators that point to exact moments in time. Solomon here declares that for every event in life, there is a moment of time. Did you catch that? For every event in life, there is a moment of time. In other words, Solomon is emphasizing that life is not composed of a series of random haphazard incidents. There's a plan to life. Someone's in charge of life our lives. And that someone is God. Life is not the product of chance, nor is it the mere product of human decision. Rather, God is in charge of every circumstance, of every life, all throughout time. That's what this passage tells us. 
You may say, well, Bruce, I don't see God's name in verse 1. It's just a generic phrase. There is a time, there is a vent for every circumstance. Well, you have to look at the context. And the context, certainly, of the book of Ecclesiastes as a whole, but even here in this passage, it is very clear that Solomon is referring to God's control. Look with me in verse 10. I have seen the business, the business that, who, what does it say? God has given to the children of men to be busy with. He, notice that specific personal pronoun, he, to whom is that referencing? God. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put enmity into man's heart. Eternity, excuse me, not enmity, that's a different message. Also, (laughs) I need to get my glasses better. He has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And this thought repeats itself over and over through this passage and throughout the entire the book. The point is that God is in control of every circumstance, of every moment, of every event that transpires in every life through all of time. That's what Solomon declares. There is a time, there is a season for every event under life. Now the sovereignty of God is the testimony of all of Scripture. This is not by any means the only location where we find this truth. This truth is repeated over and over and over again throughout Scripture, helping us to understand the sovereign nature of our eternal God. Let me invite you just to look at a couple of passages that reinforce this. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16, 33. It's up on the screen. Solomon says, the lot is cast into the lap. Now, the language is a little confusing for us in this century. We don't use lots. It's referring to a way in which they often made decisions during biblical times. And the lot refers to basically a, a, a set of dice. And it says that the set of dice are in a man's hand. But it's every decision is from the Lord. Do you get the point that he's making here? He says man can hold dice in their hands. If I wanted to make a decision by throwing dice, I could pick up a couple of dice. They're in my hand. I appear to be in control of what is going to happen. I throw the dice. I watch them. But the point is God is in control of their landing. God determines how the dice end. In other words, God is the determining factor in what is going on through all of our lives. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. Better if I just read them up here. Do I have them? Acts 17, 26. It says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. That that verse is filled with with truth and thought. But he's, he's encompassing all of history and say that God has been in charge of mankind in all of history up to the fact that he is determining their boundaries, he is determining their allotment. God is in control of nations, God is in control of cities, God is in control of families, God is in control of individual lives. God is in control. Ephesians 1, 11. It says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, and notice this phrase, who works, what's the next word? All things according to the counsel of his will. Here is the point. There is no event, there are no circumstances, there is no good news or bad news in life in which God is not in control. It's a declaration from Solomon here in Ecclesiastes 3.1. 
Secondly, Solomon provides an illustration of God's plan. Solomon follows this statement with an illustration on the comprehensive nature of God's providential, God's sovereign control. In reality, he provides a list of 28 illustrations, 28 individual activities that are presented in 14 pairs. These pairs identify the particular extremes of life and so represent everything in between. So God is going to talk about an event on this side of life and an event on that side of life, and the implication is that both the extremes and everything in between are underneath God's control. Let's read verses Ecclesiastes 3, 2 to 8. And by the way, this is, this is a poem, and you'll see the beauty of this poem. It's, it's wonderfully constructed. And the truth is deep and profound for all of us also. Ecclesiastes 3, 2 to 8. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time of peace. Do you sense what Solomon is communicating here in this passage of Scripture? 28 human activities combined in 14 pairs that illustrate the extremes of life, a time to be born and a time to die. The implication is God is in control of that moment of birth, God is in control of that moment of death, and God is in control of everything in between. 14 pairs that beautifully expound for us the sovereign nature of our God. There's several conclusions about this list, and the truth is we could delve into this list for a long time, but let me, let me seek to pull out two or three con conclusions here with you as we look at this list of 28 human activities. The first conclusion is this, even the minute details of life are under God's control. From the critical to the seemingly unimportant. Life, death, war, and peace are crucial occurrences of life in which we would request and expect divine intervention. Wouldn't you agree? Many of you know that Brian and I suffer from heart disease. We both have experienced two heart attacks, open heart surgery, multiple catheterizations. I have 11 stents in my heart, and Brian has four stents in his heart. In fact, funny story, Brian just had, as you know, a recent bout of that several weeks ago or a month or so ago, and his first message to me after he got out of the operating room, he was still in recovery, his first message to me was 11 to 4. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny, huh? <laughs> we compete about everything, 11 to 4, so I still got him by, by 7. Uh. But I want you to know that in moments like that, as you would expect, we're crying out to God for mercy. When Brian and I go in the operating room for a heart procedure, we are praying, God, I hope that you are in control of this event. Certainly I'm paying a doctor and it's his hands, but God, I want you to control the doctor's hands. I want you in control of this event, not just the doctor. Those big, crucial, critical moments of life we pray for, we expect God to be in control. But what might be surprising to us in this passage of Scripture is that God is not just in control of the big things, he's in control of the little things as well. Just think about some of these. Planting a seed. 
When someone of their own accord plants a seed, a single seed, if you will, God's in control of that planting. Casting away stones. Is that an unimportant event? How many times during the week when we're cutting our grass or, or when we're cleaning up our yard, we'll just pick up a stone and throw the stone away? That's an that's an inimpor- unimportant event in our life. But God's in control of that unimportant event because God is in control of every event, even the smallest details of our life. That's what Solomon says here. Second conclusion, and this is encouraging to me. Both the good and the bad are part of God's plan. Both the good events of life and the bad events of life are part of God's plan. Uh, Here, if you analyze the passage of Scripture, there's there's a purposeful interplay here between those events that are desirable, that's the letter D, and events that are undesirable, that's the letter U. Look with me just at a few verses. Verse 2. A time to be born. That's a desirable event, isn't it? When I was born, I think that was a good event for my mother and father. I don't think they were surprised when Brian came out and then I came out three minutes later, right? I hope they weren't disappointed by that. That was a desirable event. A time to be born when we had our children. That was a desirable event. A time to die. Well, we that know Jesus Christ as Savior, even death is desirable for us. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But from a human perspective, death is a time of separation. It's a time of pain. It's a time of loss. It's an undesirable event. But God's in control of that. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up. And you can see back and forth, there's this interaction between good events and bad events of life. By the way, it might surprise you to think that God's in control of bad events because we might think that God is only in control of good events. I want to mention a quote in just a few moments that say, how much better it is to to trust in the wise, all-knowing hand of our God in the midst of bad events. God's in control. A couple things to, to note about this about this interaction, this interplay between desirable and undesirable is that this interplay is not chaotic. Now think with me about this. We tend to view our life, this interplay between good events and bad events as as chaotic, just fortuitous. It's just by chance that these things happened. This person is, is experiencing good things by chance. That person is experiencing bad things just by chance. This passage of Scripture excuse me, this this order that's found within the text, desirable, indesirable, helps us to understand that there is a plan. That that plan is ordered by God. It's not chaotic. It's not random. If you look at this, this desirable, indesirable, it is obvious that there is a flow to all of this, and God is in control of that flow. Isn't that good news? We'll mention this a little bit further, but this list of good and bad also shows us that life ends on a positive note. I don't think we have it up there, but on that list, the last one is desirable. And I think there's a message there for us. God's saying that you're going to go through good and bad through life, but I'm in control and my goal for your life is a good end. Today might not be good, but the end of life will be good. God is in control of both the good and the bad ends. Let me read this quote. I have it on the screen a little further along. We might return to it. But Jerry Bridges, in his book, Trusting God When Life Hurts, says this, The sovereignty of God is the one impregnable rock to which the suffering heart can cling. The circumstances surrounding our lives are no accident 
They might be the work of evil, but that evil is held firmly within the mighty hand of our sovereign God. Are we truly left to the mercy of a stalled car? Are we truly left to people who are in position to harm us? No, a thousand times no. We are in the hands of a sovereign God who controls every circumstance of our life. Do you believe that? That's what Solomon says here. God's in control of the good and the bad. Another conclusion that I draw from this list of illustrations is that even human activity falls underneath God's control. Now, admittedly, in our theological discussions, we struggle to explain, to understand the interaction between human free will and divine sovereignty. And this passage is not minimizing the free will that we have, but what God is saying is all of the choices that we freely make end up being the plan of God. Some of these are just things that people do spontaneously spontaneously cry or, or spontaneously laugh or spontaneously break out in a dance. In their mind, this is just a spontaneous action. But God is in control of those also. In Grudem's Systematic Theology, he describes it this way. I like this. God cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to freely act as they do. So even in mankind's free actions, God is in control. So let me give you an illustration from Scripture. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is sold into slavery by his jealous and his hateful brothers. This was a traitorous, a selfless act. They were jealous of Joseph and the love that his father had for them. And they, in hatred, sold their brethren into slavery to the Egyptian caravan that was passing through. But listen to how jo Joseph describes that event later on in chapter 45. Jo Joseph said, Now therefore do not be grieved, my brothers, nor angry with yourselves. You sold me hither. But God intended to send me before you to save your life. Do you get that point? Was it the brother's actions to sell Joseph into slavery? Certainly it was. But where was God in the picture? God was controlling those events so as to assure a good end for Joseph and his family. Solomon illustrates the comprehensive nature of divine sovereignty. God is in control of every event in every life throughout all of time. Finally, in this passage, Solomon emphasizes the comfort of this plan. Look with me in verses 9 to 15. Solomon says, what gain has the worker from his toil? I often ask myself that question. Do you ever ask yourself that question? <laughs> On Monday morning, what gain is there in this toil of my life? I have seen the business God has given to the children of men to be busy with. And notice this verse, and we're going to allude to it. He makes everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's hearts, yet so that he can find, cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Thank you, sir. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people may fear him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Confusing terms, I understand that. We struggle with this. 
I encourage you to go home and, and relook at this passage of Scripture, read through this passage of Scripture, and try to understand all the details of this. But here Solomon is encouraging us to rest in God's plan, to find comfort in the fact that our God is in control. While we may prefer our plan, we may prefer to think that we're in control. There appears to be great success or security in my thinking that I'm in control, right? I control my own destiny. And again, I'm not at this point talking about the interplay between God's sovereignty and human free will. I'm just saying that God is in control of all of this. And that should provide us great comfort because he alone is good. He alone is wise. He alone is powerful enough to assure his good ends. So this should provide us great comfort. Three reasons for this comfort, and then I'll close. By the way, I don't see a clock anywhere, so I guess I'm allowed to preach till I want to end, right? <laughs> oh, there it is, all the way up there. Okay. Yeah, you hide it all the way up in the top, so I don't know where it is. Three reasons. First of all, and I alluded to this, God makes everything beautiful in his time. Do you believe that? Come on, you can do better than that, I hope. That's an amazing truth. In the midst of bad news, in the midst of frustration, confusion, pain, and even suffering, and by the way, this was Solomon's conclusion after years of having studied human life. And Solomon expe himself experienced great highs and great lows, experienced success, experienced failure, experienced separation, experienced punishment. Solomon says, after I've studied it all, this is the conclusion that I've come to. God makes everything beautiful in his time. The point is that God is making something beautiful out of your life even when we experience bad news. This truth is evidenced over and over in Scripture. Can I give you just a couple of illustrations? The disciples are caught in a terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. Any of you that have been on the Sea of Galilee, you know that rough and rugged storms can, can arise frequently and they're very strong. So here, this small fisherman's boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, what is it, 13 miles by 7 miles, they're in the middle of this sea and a large storm comes and their boat is being tossed from one side to the other. They didn't know what was going to happen. That's bad news if you're a sailor. But Jesus comes walking on the water. That's good news. <laughs> Don't you think that's what they thought? When they saw Jesus coming, even though the storm was blowing, here comes the Lord. That's good news. And he calmed the storm. God turned a beautiful, or excuse me, a powerful storm into something beautiful that demonstrated his glory. Paul and Silas because they were preaching the gospel, end up in a jail in Philippi. Jails in that time were much worse than any experience that we can offer here in the United States of America. It was a, it was a time of suffering and pain and discouragement. That was bad news for Paul and Silas. Didn't know what was going to transpire. Would they survive? Would they not survive? Would this be the moment of their martyrdom? They weren't sure. Would they again be beaten and flogged for the cause of Christ? An earthquake comes. More bad news. <laughs> You're down in this dungeon and it starts shaking and, and rocks start falling. That's not good news at that moment. That's bad news. But as a result of that, Paul and Silas are able to escape the jail. And they're able to witness to the Philippian jailer, and he and his family come to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's good news.
Jesus. You see how God took the painful, the scary, the difficult, and turned it into something beautiful. Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, comes, is born of a virgin, and John tells us that his own did not receive him. He was rejected of men. Finally, he was placed on a cruel cross. His hands were nailed to that cross, as were his feet. A spear was plunged into his side. The disciples at that time thought that was bad news. Their Savior was dying. But the death of Jesus Christ is the basis of our forgiveness of sins and our reconciliation with God. That was good news. We could all give illustrations. I'll use this one just because I know Brian used it last week. You're all familiar with their beautiful daughter, Amber. 24 years ago, she turns 24 on Wednesday of this week, Amber does. When Amber was born in Mexico, that was beautiful life. But the circumstances around that, that was bad news. But if you spent any time with Brian and Vicki, you'll hear them say that Amber is one of the greatest gifts that God gave to them. Bad news or good news? See, God makes everything beautiful in his time. 1989, Brian and Vicki were in Mexico. We had just joined them at that time, and because of Amber's problems, it was necessary for them to leave Mexico. That was bad news for me. I had just joined my brother in Mexico, and we had great dreams of working together. That was bad news. But God brought Brian here, and he's your pastor today. See, that's good news. That's the way our God operates. God takes the bad things of life and makes them beautiful. Not in my time, but in his time. It's the promise here. By the way, even Jeff Mack's book, that book, (laughs) that children's book that we talked about, if you show the last slide, even that book ends with very good news. (laughs) Solomon also says that enjoyment can be found even in the midst of difficulty. Have you found this to be true? Even in the midst of our greatest suffering, there's opportunities for joy, peace, and happiness. Certainly that's because of the last point we just mentioned. God's in control. He's making it all beautiful. But it's possible for us even to enjoy moments of pain. Look with me in verse 12. Solomon says, I perceive that there was nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. This is an important point because we are not called just to endure this life until the end, but we are called to enjoy this life even in the midst of our suffering as a gift from God. So he says... He says, eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy it. Enjoy life as a gift from God. And then finally, I need to conclude. Solomon says that the frustrations of life are intended. They have a purpose to lead us to God. I love this phrase, he has put eternity in man's heart. The implication is that we were created for something bigger, something deeper, something longer, something wider than this life. We were created for a relationship with God. 
And we struggle because of our rebellion, because of our depravity, because of our self-will. We struggle with that. We want to carve out our own life. But God in his sovereignty, God in his grace, God in his mercy often allows us to experience difficult things of life to point us to Christ. To help us realize what's really important in life. So that we may know and appreciate the deepness of our relationship with Christ. Last year I was pointed to a book called A Severe Mercy. It's a great book. I recommend that you read it. It was written by a man named Sheldon Van Alken. He's called Van in the book. And it recounts the wonderful story of love and marriage between he and his wife, Jean Davis. She's called Davy. They met as teenagers. They immediately fell in love. They shared common interests like poetry, art, literature, the sea. They were enraptured with each other such that very early in that relationship, they made a vow, and they called this vow the shining barrier. And the vow was that they were going to allow nothing in their life to come between them. For all of their lives, they would be the most important thing to each other. It was a deep, it's a rich love story, by the way. Great story. Voted book of the year a couple years ago. Eventually, Van and Davy moved to Oxford, England. He was a scholar. They were studying there at Oxford, and they became close friends with the Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis. And through that friendship, through spending time over coffee, or probably tea there, right? Spending time over tea, Van and Davy trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. He graduated from Oxford. They moved back to the United States. Van took up a teaching position at Lynchburg College. They were both now believers. They were slowly growing in their relationship with the Lord. But Davy took that relationship much more seriously than did Van. In fact, Van was jealous of God because God was beginning to take the place of prominence in Davy's life that he felt he wanted. After all, it was their shining barrier. And he didn't want anything, not even God, who had saved him to penetrate that barrier. Well, as the story goes, Davy becomes ill and she eventually passes away. Van is devastated by her death until through a series of letters, 18 letters, between him and C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis helps him to understand that God in his mercy, God in what he calls a severe mercy, took David home to heaven, Davy home to heaven, excuse me, so that Van could pursue an unhindered relationship with Christ. C.S. Lewis wrote, and this is one of the letters, you have been treated with a severe mercy, Van. You have been brought to see that you were jealous of God. So from us, you by God's grace have been led back to us and to God. Van eventually acknowledges that truth and he wrote this book to testify how God made even his wife's death beautiful by leading him back to a deeper relationship with Christ. That's how God works. He makes even the frustrations, the sufferings of this life into a beautiful masterpiece that draws us closer to him. So while the frustrations of life cause constant frustration, a reliance upon God's sovereignty, this is the point, please listen to me. While the frustrations of our life or the circumstances in life cause us deep frustration, a reliance upon God's sovereignty minimizes life's pain and infuses life with joy peace, and confidence for the future. So how are you responding to the frustrations of life? Are you resting? 
Are you resting in God's sovereignty? Here's the point. God makes everything beautiful in his time. Father, we thank you for the truth of this passage of Scripture. It's pretty deep. It's hard for us to comprehend. Some of it is hard for us to accept. We like being in control. We like thinking that we're the boss. But the truth is that thought crumbles as we face the difficult circumstances and the frustrations of life. We thank you that you're an all-powerful God who not only can do what you want, but knows what is best for each and every one of us. Help us to find rest in you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.